Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, this is Joan Tabachnik, and um, I am actually uh, calling in from Baltimore today, and I see we've got people from all over the country, as well as Canada and Ireland and England, so it's really great to see so many people um, joining us today. I think we have, at this point, over 200 and climbing, which is um, really just exciting to see so much interest in these webinars. Um, I also just want to, for people who may not know about NERI Press, um, our mission is to share the cutting edge research and best practices emerging in our field. And for many years we sold only books. In the last five years we've begun, we've begun to offer a lot of online courses, um, free newsletters that takes a research article each month and puts that into an easy to read newsletter um, about what are, are the most cutting edge issues that we think in the field. And also most recently now these webinars and um, by some of our internationally recognized authors. I also want to take a moment to just talk about um, Neary School. And uh, the Neary School is, the, the only reason that we actually are here at Neary Press is because of the school. We couldn't exist without them. Uh, Neary School was founded over 30 years ago to provide uh, special education services to students ages 7 to 22. Um, but because of the cutbacks now in, the, in uh, both federal and state funding, this has forced um, basically for the first time Neary, for Neary School to do a uh, a fundraising campaign to help uh, keep this school vibrant and alive and really maintain some of the highest standards. So for years the school really lends support to Neary Press and now I'm hoping that maybe some of uh, the, the people who take advantage of Neary Press might um, return the favor. So um, if you can take a moment at the end of the webinar and maybe go to nearyschool.org um, and uh, learn a little bit more about uh, the school and if you can to make a donation, a donation of any kind. Um, as I said, we wouldn't be around if it wasn't for the school, so we wanted to just pass, pass that along. I also want to take a moment to, to, um, to just see how many people here um, have ever attended a Neary press webinar before. So I'm launching a poll um, and you can see it. if you could just click on uh, whether or not uh, you ever have attended one before. We want to get a sense of these are our new listeners. Uh, people are familiar with it. It looks like we have about um, uh, two-thirds, one-third split. Uh, about, uh, let's see, we have about 60, 61, 62 percent who said yes and uh, 38% uh, who have said no, um, that you're new to, or new to uh, Neary Press. So welcome to those who are new. And uh, please take a moment you know, after the webinar to take a look at the Neary Press website as well. So thanks very much for participating in that quick poll. And I um, want to just also take, I think I, I can share that. Uh, this, is, this is also new to me. So hopefully uh, you can see that. That's the final results, 62 to 38. So as, look, like, as any... Um, kind of workshop, we like to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so first I want to take a chance to offer you uh, the learning objectives for this for this webinar. Uh, first is to learn the definition of developmental psychopathology and how it guides the assessment and case formulation. Two is to identify three developmental domains that should be routinely included in crafting individual case formulations. And three, to distinguish between actuarial assessments of risk and a developmentally informed functional behavior analysis approach. So these are, uh, and uh, Robert is going to be wonderful enough to explain all three of those within 30 minutes. Uh, second, I want to let you know that the PowerPoint is posted on the Neary Press website. So if you just go to nearypress.org, you can actually see the PowerPoint. So you don't have to worry about furiously taking notes. You can actually download that. And we will also be posting a recording of this webinar next week. So if you want to listen to it again or share it with a friend or a colleague, please feel free to do that as well. Third, uh, when the workshop is over, please be sure to close out your account. Uh, we will be sending you an evaluation, and we only send that to you if you close out your account. And we truly would love your feedback, so please take the time to do that. And finally, after about a week, we'll be sending you a follow-up email that has a link to the recording, a link to the PowerPoint, and also a link to the certificate of completion. So uh, all of that will be coming to you about a week from uh, today after listening to this webinar. Um, we also uh, have... CE credits now for, uh, for the first time. So for this, if you listen to this and you want CE credits, you can go to orlandobehaviorhealth.org and you'll be able to pay for and get a CE credit for this, get one CE credit and they'll cost $5. Uh, next year we actually will be offering um, a CE credits. You can do it individual like you were doing today or you can buy the whole series or if you want to become a sponsor, um, as an individual sponsor for $98, uh, you will be guaranteed a seat at these, each of these webinars. 
two, uh, we will be offering you two books of a value of $149. And third, um, we'll give you nine CE credits. So really for that $98, you're getting almost a $200 value. So we hope you'll maybe think about becoming a sponsor for our 2014-2015 webinar series. So the book that uh, that Robert's going to be talking about today is um, really is one that when I read it, um, and I always had a chance to read our Neary Press book, but when I read this one in particular, it really helped me see how important it is um, for, to listen to Robert's message about having a developmental context for any client that you work with. So this booklet lays out a developmental framework with vivid case examples that, um, that bring to life, I think, this really vital developmental treatment and risk management perspective. So whether you're a clinician who are looking to develop an accurate case formulation or you're a school counselor trying to understand the at-risk youth in your office. This booklet, I think, will really open your eyes to the story behind the developmental, the development of sexual behavior problems. And uh, Robert, if you don't know, I really want to take a moment to reduce him. I'm really thrilled to do so. Robert, in addition to having a, a fabulous sense of humor, um, is a clinical and a forensic psychologist and attorney uh, who's currently in the administration and faculty at the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology. He's also a senior associate at the National Center for Mental Health and Juvenile Justice. He has worked with youth and adults in clinical and forensic settings since 1984 with a special focus on people with histories of physical aggression and or problematic sexual behaviors. He's also worked with adjudicated, uh, those with adjudicated sexual offenses. He was recently appointed to the Massachusetts Governor's Sexual Offender Recidivism Commission, so hopefully we'll be changing a lot of what we'll be doing here in Massachusetts as well. So I think without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to you, Robert. And really welcome. I really look forward to hearing your talk today. Thank you, Joan. Um, let me just make the transition here. And thank you for a very generous introduction and the opportunity to do this webinar with Neary Press. I'd also like to welcome my colleagues from around the United States, uh, Canada, Ireland, and perhaps even elsewhere. Uh, good day to you, uh, no matter what time of day it is, where you are, and invite you to join me in thinking together on the work that we do with youth with problematic sexual behaviors, uh, some of whom have moved on to become adjudicated sexual offenders and in many places thereby um, enter uh, a world in which they may be subject to prosecution as adults or confinement or uh, registry uh, for some periods of their lives. Uh, so the stakes uh, can be very high in our work with youth with problematic sexual behavior. And this is an effort to engage in what I imagine will be an ongoing conversation. And I also want to acknowledge my co-author, colleague, and friend, Dr. Craig Latham, from whom I have ruthlessly stolen a number of these slides and uh, most of the good ideas. He's been really quite uh, a colleague in our work together. He had first introduced me to youth with sexually abusive behaviors uh, in the mid-1980s, and it's been a wonderful collaboration ever since, and he's also a co-author on the, the monograph. So I'd like to introduce Christian. Christian is a student who's been making sexually explicit remarks to Abby. Abby's a classmate, and this has been going on for about three weeks. She finally told her teacher that he's been making sexual comments to her daily, and uh, they are in the same math class. Uh, and she sees him uh, between classes, but for whatever reason, he only makes sexual comments during study hall. Now, Christian frequently tries to sit next to Abby when in class, and when she won't allow this, he becomes extremely angry and mutters things like, okay, I can see how it is. Five days ago, Christian slapped Abby on her bottom, gestured towards his crotch, and told her, I can make your dreams come true. Three days ago, he boasted about his strength to other students and threatened to beat up Abby, although he made no attempt to harm her and um, has not actually at any point uh, before. Two days ago, Abby knelt to get a book from a low shelf and Christian said, oh, I like it when you're on your knees. Later the same day, Abby went over to pick up something and Christian said, do you like it from behind? And today he came over and tried to hug her as he has done several times before. She was able to avoid him by turning away and he became uh, very angry and he stormed out of the room. Now I acknowledge that this is a very limited behavior sample for Christian, but 
we might want to begin thinking about what is his risk of continuing to engage in this behavior and why, whether or not we have enough information to assign some sort of risk rating on the basis of what we know, the kinds of things that we would want to know about Christian as uh, we begin trying to assign him a risk rating and begin to think about uh, a case formulation and a risk management and intervention plan with him and the contours of some sort of intervention that over time might reduce his risk of engaging in this behavior or similar behaviors going forward and ask ourselves some questions uh, from a clinical point of view this is one of many potential questions but would it make any difference to us if Christian met all of the criteria for an autism spectrum uh, disorder Would it make any difference if you knew Christian had 10 prior adjudications for property and for non-sexual crimes? What else do you need to know about him to develop a risk management and a treatment plan? Do you have any hypotheses based on the brief information that you have about the function of his behavior? There are a couple of ways in which the field has begun to shift as we understand youth with sexually abusive behaviors. i am been around this uh, field of professional endeavor long enough to have experienced the old and the transition to the, the new. In the inception of its work, of our work with youth, in which we largely had drawn research and models from work with adult sexual offenders, we uh, presumed or believed that recidivism was nearly 100% amongst youth with problematic sexual behaviors and in particular amongst adjudicated juvenile sex offenders. We now have research that would suggest that it is much, much less than that. Uh, some research shows that it is uh, at or perhaps slightly below 7% and the bulk of the research would suggest it sexual recidivism specifically is about 7 to 16 percent but certainly not the 50 percent 80 percent 90 percent or close to 100 percent that uh, many clinicians still presume is, is the actual rate of recidivism also borrowing from the adult models uh, largely from rape and child molesters uh, problematic sexual behavior was uh, thought to arise from deviant arousal and power and control dynamics. We've learned since then that uh, while there are some youth that do have deviant arousal, uh, problematic sexual behaviors uh, in children is rarely due to deviant sexual arousal or yet maintained by deviant sexual arousal. Interventions were targeted to suppress negative behavior. That is still the case. We still want to reduce problematic sexual behavior, but now more attention is paid to the dimensions of treatment in which we teach or enhance positive replacement behaviors. And beyond that, try and teach kids uh, skills for positive community engagement, uh, success in school or pre-vocation, um, and success with peers. We believed, uh, and often, much of this time, the relapse prevention uh, model was really the only available clinical tool we had that, that seemed um, even a reasonable way to proceed. We learned that in traditional individual psychotherapy had not been particularly helpful, but it was thought that relapse prevention approaches were the only approaches that worked. And now we're beginning to suspect that without more, relapse prevention models are largely ineffective with youth. I recall being told quite firmly by seasoned hands in the field that we did not want youth in sex offender specific treatment to address their own histories of victimization because they would readily convert that into what was termed at the time the abuse excuse. So we would treat trauma last if at all. We're now beginning to understand that many of the youth with problematic sexual behaviors come with high trauma loads and multiple childhood adverse experiences that we want to pay attention to trauma immediately and as a core feature of an effective treatment. We really had for a considerable period of time only one model of treatment and so almost by default it was a one-size-fits-all treatment and with many 
kinds of uh, clinical care, including uh, cancer treatments and neurology and the like, uh, we're increasingly moving towards an individualized treatment model as more options become available to us and as we begin to think more developmentally and flexibly. We worked with what we had in the research, largely because for many years there was not a great deal of research. So our assessments were limited to these intuitive risk factors that did not have a great deal of scientific support. Now we look towards assessments that include the entire child, the whole child, in context of their specific social ecology rather than risk factors, many of which resided in the in the individual of the of the child and were not uh, terribly attentive to the social ecology and developmental status of the child. And increasingly there's a focus upon the developmental characteristics of the child precisely to individualize management and treatment. Some of the key developmental domains that are useful to uh, investigate in any given risk assessment and treatment planning enterprise for a problematic sexual behavior, the child's temperament. Temperament and IQ are the two most stable psychological features of an individual over the course of their developmental lifespan. If it is possible to get accurate information about their temperament in infancy, early childhood, uh, that's often very helpful in beginning to understand their developmental trajectory. We'll want to know about the developmental trajectories of their neurocognitive development, their physical development, their attachment and attachment style emotional development, especially emotional regulation development, social development, moral reasoning development, and of course their sexual development as well. We've also learned that although developmental psychology textbooks often present developmental phases as though they were building blocks, in fact Developmental domains don't neatly unfold in sharp stages and phases. Think of currents flowing and with these developmental domains interacting together rather than building blocks where they are uh, being constructed one silo at a time with very little interaction with each other. It's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to, to skip a stage or to push a stage uh, before the the previous stages are, are sufficiently completed to be able to support the development, but it's also possible, especially under conditions of stress or adversity, for children to lose progress and to have to reestablish their uh, developmental unfolding as adversity either passes or they develop the resiliencies to effectively manage the adversities. And it reminds us again that the developmental domains are dynamic and interactive in complex ways and again, are deeply shaped by the social ecology of the developing child. The developmental perspective reminds us that behaviors, uh, including problematic sexual behaviors, reflect a continuous narrative, that these behaviors have functions and meanings, and that these behaviors occur in multiple complex and interacting contexts that are constantly shifting within the child's developmental arc. In fact, the same behaviors may have different meanings and serve different functions at different developmental stages. For example, an act of a specific behavior reflecting an act of sexual abuse um, at one point in a child's life may be an effort at uh, exacting revenge against uh, a third party by uh, abusing the child of that third party. At another point, that same behavior may reflect a misguided attempt to achieve uh, emotional intimacy with another person. Um, and at yet another phase, the same behavior may be an attempt to uh, coerce a sexual partner uh, or uh, might represent an effort in a particular peer group to gain social status. But in order to understand developmental psychopathology, one must first understand normative development. That is to say, normative development gives us an idea of the expectable range of developmental trajectories for youth who are in uh, relatively stable um, and holding environments for them. Developmental psychopathology is the nature and the degree and the persistence of deviation from 
developmentally normative trajectories. So in order to understand developmental psychopathology, we need to understand normative development uh, first and in a very sophisticated way. For example, we would want to have a developmental perspective on the behaviors of younger kids. We actually know more about younger kids in many ways than we do about older ones because there have been some very specific studies on sexualized behaviors in younger children that grew out of uh, efforts to understand um, and to investigate the sexual abuse experiences of younger children in uh, child protection and criminal prosecutions. But the same kind of sexual touching of younger kids uh, may reflect any one of a number of different possible uh, functions or meanings for that child. And here is a list of some of those that we see. There are problems with risk assessment approaches that do not reflect development and uh, which do not deeply incorporate developmental considerations into describing what uh, Craig uh, taught me to think of as a risk narrative. Uh, one of the things that we are beginning to appreciate is that uh, assigning risk levels, low, medium, and high, for example, uh, typically reflects a focus upon uh, a, a trait, as though this sort of high risk, medium risk, or low risk travels around with the, the child as part of themselves as an individual. And we know both that that kind of risk, static risk rating, uh, tends to both uh, too, too narrowly uh, uh, consider the context in which the problematic sexual behavior tends to occur and also to fail to incorporate adequately developmental features of the child. So some of the things that we want to take a look at with any given child are their age, their individual developmental arc, their own history of resiliencies and vulnerabilities, the kinds of developmental supports and insults that they have had available or experienced or uh, in case of supports may, may have failed to have experience, the shifts in function and meaning over time of specific behaviors, and of course our friend the contextual contributions to risk. The world of adult risk assessment has made a transition from relying um, on unstructured clinical judgment to relying increasingly upon structured professional judgment and in the effort to develop actuarial tools. Uh, one of the reasons that there's been a major movement in both adult and child risk assessment is that it's very clear that both structured professional judgment and the use of tools can improve upon unstructured clinical judgment, which uh, is notoriously uh, unreliable, uh, notoriously vulnerable to overpredictions of violence, the so-called false positives, and notoriously with poor inter-rater reliability, except in the most clear and obvious of cases. Um, on the adult side, the recidivism rates are high enough amongst persons who have sexual offenses that it is possible to develop statistically based actuarial tools. This is a very challenging thing to do uh, with juveniles because uh, even for general delinquency, non-sexual delinquency, the developmental tide is going out as youth age. Um, most of them will desist in their criminal misconduct um, as they age and mature. And so we're trying to develop a statistical tool while the baseline, the base rate is dropping anyway. And amongst juvenile sex offenders, as we saw, it's complicated further by the fact that we have a very low base rate of reoffense to begin with. So they offer very little predictive validity. There's not much guidance from them to devise specific interventions. Uh, they're not terribly good at accounting for contextual variables. And youth in these large group-based assessment tools are assumed to be developmentally equivalent. So if this is a tool, for example, for use with youth between who are the ages of, say, 10 and 18, a sexually abusive behavior by a 10-year-old uh, is assumed to be developmentally equivalent for risk assessment purposes of, a, of the same behavior when uh, enacted by a 16 or a, a 17 year old and that's not a developmentally uh, sustainable assertion. Uh, they typically do not 
consider protective factors, many of the things that we want to try to um, harness in the environment and, and the other contextual and temporal factors that can contribute to uh, increased or, or lowered risk. An alternative approach is one that is highly individualized. One is derived from the targeted threat assessment model that was developed by the United States Secret Service. This is, best way of putting it, is kind of an N of one. It is a, an intensive case analysis of the risks posed or made by a particular individual for particular behavior. They devised it on persons who attempted to assassinate protected uh, figures. They did the study, again, trying to understand the dynamics of adolescents who had committed mass school shootings, and it's a an N of one approach, which is a very valuable way of looking at someone moving up uh, or down uh, a risk trajectory uh, on a, for specific uh, target behavior, and here problematic sexual behavior. A second approach is also essentially an N of one study, and this is the functional behavioral analysis of, of uh, PSBs in the individual case. And the third is essentially a, a chronological developmental history um, in which the problematic sexual behaviors are put into a developmental context and the so-called risk narrative uh, which uh, is developed over time. These are not mutually exclusive and in sophisticated uh, risk assessment uh, management uh, uh, assessments, they are, are often bundled together, together uh, in some way or another. So in looking for risk narratives for sexual behavior problems in children, we want to look for biological predispositions or vulnerabilities to inappropriate sexual behavior uh, or misconduct um, at all, actually. So things like interuterine insults, uh, early histories of lead poisoning and the like, developmental insults, when they occur, their impact upon emotional regulation, attachment, neurocognitive capacities, learning style and the like, um, and their persistence, if they do, over the course of the of, of the developmental uh, lifespan and uh, their contribution to PSBs, ways in which they are linked to the problematic sexual behaviors. The vulnerabilities that, li that limit adaptive coping and the resiliency factors equally, equally important in an assessment that enhance adaptive coping because it's going to be the protective and resiliency factors that you can build upon that will be important components to an effective intervention. We want a description of the ways in which these vulnerabilities and resiliency factors interact, and this will help us determine the type of treatment in which the child can participate. So, for example, if you have a uh, juvenile sex offender treatment group where the presumed IQ range is between about 80 and 100, the sort of uh, lower average or upper borderline IQ range, and you have a child uh, who has either a 120 IQ or a child who has a 55 IQ, uh, those two cognitive outliers are going to be a very poor fit for the kind of verbally mediated uh, group treatment um, that may, uh, and, and sort of interpersonal quality that uh, you would otherwise be tempted to assign them to. So a developmentally informed uh, description of PSB will describe all of these things. You can read them for themselves, but uh, especially important are the age of onset, the course, and the influences on the course of the development of the PSB and its manifestation and the social and environmental context of PSBs, especially since uh, children and adolescents are so profoundly embedded into their uh, social ecology and the domains in which they operate. All of these bullet points are then placed into a developmental life narrative. The eight types of sexual behavior narratives that often emerge when constructing these life histories are ones that reflect normal sexual exploration, a certain degree of sexual reactivity to their own sexual uh, victimization, extensive mutual sexual behaviors, often ones that develop in peer groups or in families and are maintained by the cultures of peer groups and families, children who are genuinely sexually aggressive and coercive, children who are severely traumatized and the sexual behavior may have a very complex place in their post-traumatic adaptation, developmentally delayed children uh, where they may be reflecting their own uh, history of, of sexual experience or sexual victimization, but may also merely be uh, hitting puberty, for example, and without 
uh, the emotional or the intellectual capacities that most youth entering uh, puberty uh, bring with them. So making errors, for example, around social boundaries or managing the intensity of, of, of sexual feelings. Uh, autism spectrum disorder children and mentally ill children. So a little more information on Christian as we get ready to wrap up. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He's 16 years old. He was in the 10th grade at the time that this occurred at a small public school. He has an IQ of 120, but that's really not a fair representation of his IQ uh, because the split between his uh, verbals-based IQ or capacities and his performance-based IQ uh, was significant. And so he was better seen instead as reflecting the kind of cognitive structure of a youth with Asperger's syndrome. Until this incident occurred, he had no prior history of problematic sexual behavior. Since his early childhood, when he had been diagnosed with Asperger's, Abby, the target of this behavior, and Ian had really been his only friends. But they had been loyal friends, and they had buffered him uh, and his uh, difficulties in social interactions due to his Asperger's uh, very effectively. They were the ones who had mediated his involvement in peer groups, made sure he went to birthday parties, took, uh, took part in, in peer activities. As they've now entered grade 10, Abby and Ian are now dating. Uh, and this, this trio, these three musketeers, are now beginning to have uh, an internal pairing of Abby and Ian. This greatly confused Christian who took his cues from Ian. He had seen Ian affectionately patting uh, Abby on her bottom. He had seen Ian kissing Abby um, in the very rigid way that someone with Asperger's syndrome may interpret a social situation. Uh, he thought that they as the three musketeers would share these um, opportunities and experiences with each other. And when he uh, tried to do so with Abby and she redirected, he became enraged. He became absolutely um, enraged and began to uh, approach her in this way and to insist that she had that he had the same rights to Abby's affections and to those uh, behaviors as did uh, Ian. He also refused to uh, to stop. Uh, he was so rigidly fixed on this that he would not participate in any kind of uh, intervention uh, or redirection. Uh, he was absolutely outraged to uh, his soul about the way in which he was being mistreated here. Now, this is the only young person to whom he had ever uh, uh, engaged in the problematic sexual behavior. Um, one way of thinking about him is that he is engaging in indecent assault and battery and he's beginning to escalate and he poses a very serious risk. And to Abby, that's probably true. His risk of, of reoffense, of trying to touch her again or threatening her again, is probably very high. On the other hand, he had no interest in any other girl um, whatsoever. And so the solution in this particular case, rather than to label him a high uh, risk offender, was to take into serious account his developmental uh, profile, his history, um, his rigidity, and he was simply transferred to another school where he graduated without further incidents and continued on in college without any further incident. So what we're really trying to do uh, collectively as a field, I think, is move beyond relapse prevention and to individualize developmentally the kinds of responses uh, that we want to offer to children and their families who have problematic sexual behavior. Um, this would probably mean moving away from the offense cycle metaphor entirely because it's not entirely clear with children and adolescents um, how useful an offense cycle model is, but rather think more in terms of a, an individualized linear life narrative in which we can then uh, look at the individual level for what might be the best fit for them across multiple domains and intervene with those domains in order to minimize risk over time while also providing them skills for more pro-social engagement. Thank you. I look forward to questions. Thank you, Robert. And um, it always amazes me um, how much you can pack into just 30 minutes. So um, what I wanted to, um, we're getting a lot of questions, which is great. I just want to encourage people to keep um, you know, sending their questions. Um, but maybe just starting with um, some, some real, ba real basic one that came through, the thing that might be important is if you could maybe just explain or just briefly explain 
um, but you're talking a lot about the relapse prevention approach, and not everybody on our uh, webinar actually understands what that is. If you could just give me a quick uh, overview of that, and then maybe how that development, how that research relapse prevention approach um, fits into this developmental approach um, okay. as well. Okay. Um, the relapse pre prevention model was eventually dev originally devised for use with adults with substance abuse uh, issues, and the idea was that you would uh, identify essentially your relapse cycle. Relapse in this case meaning uh, resumption of substance use or uh, of too much substance. And the idea was that you would note the cycle of uh, risky situations, for example, the ways you put them in there, uh, yourself in those risky situations, your cognitions at those times. And the idea was that because you had uh, had this experience repeatedly, you could sort of detect the pattern in it um, where you over time would be able to uh, identify and more effectively manage your, uh, your relapse cycle. Uh, that model in addictions was transferred uh, to adult sexual offending um, and then to juvenile offending. Uh, at its heart, it has an underlying addictions conception, um, although it's less explicit in sex offender treatment groups for juveniles. Uh, but it's also true we have that true deviant arousal is unusual in youth. It presumes that the target behavior has occurred sufficiently frequently to be able to confidently identify triggers and responses. Uh, but arguably, a, the history of a 40-year-old alcoholic who's been abusing alcohol since age 13 is a much, a much better fit for this than a 13-year-old who may have only had limited incidents of problematic sexual behavior, and those may have had a relatively recent onset. Mm -hmm. So the developmental approach would at least push for relapse prevention models that have not already done so to evolve a more explicitly developmentally informed approach, uh, both in terms of how they're run, but also to whom, uh, whom they assign to this model. It would also push to have this model think more broadly about positive life skills like the good lives model, or to take into account key responsivity factors like incorporating the approaches of a, of a work called Navigating the Social World, uh, which is a, a work for, uh, a book for helping with clinical work with persons with Asperger's uh, syndrome like, like Christian had. So um, it would push the development of the relapse prevention model, uh, at least. Uh, maybe approaches would eventually replace it while keeping some of the approaches where it's helpful. Um, mm -hmm. Or that we may be pushing in a more radical direction entirely with a life uh, a, a risk life narrative um, and individualized approaches to uh, children's needs. That's great, thank you. Um, a lot of, um, quite a few people actually have been asking about um, how you know, are um, basically are there risk assessment tools that incorporate your perspectives and um, and how would you suggest people using some of the existing tools like the eraser and the uh, the JSO things like that? Okay. Um, the way that I would think about using the eraser or the JSOAP is to use them for what they are good at, which is getting you away from the world of unstructured clinical judgment into the world of structured clinical practice. This, but to also understand the limitations of the tools, uh, to use them as a beginning for an assessment um, and risk management and intervention plan for sexual uh, problematic sexual behavior, but not as the anchors and not as the drivers, but as a beginning. Um, one of the things that can help you do is have some structured uh, judgment based on the existing literature of sort of where does this kid sit relative to other kids based on factors that are found in the literature? We don't have a robust uh, actuarial tool where we can do that in a very helpful way uh, with, with statistical assignment of a number, for example. Uh, but it also will help us remember that context matters and development matters. So beginning, beginning to, to use the eraser, the, the JSOAP or the JSRAT or other tools that are available um, as the beginning um, rather than as they are sometimes used, which is uh, this is what a kid looks like on this particular tool, therefore he is low, medium, or high. Uh, in fact, we probably want to stay away from establishing a static risk rating like low, medium, or high uh, precisely because there are very, very few 
children that are statically low, medium, or high uh, across all the context in the current time and certainly are unlikely to remain statically low, medium, or high as development continues to unfold. We need to be thinking more in terms of trait rather than, uh, in terms of state rather than trait, context and development rather than some kind of reified risk rating that we then sort of park on the child's head as they move across uh, their life and in time through their lives. Great, thank you. you um, and I just you know, I feel like you know, these are uh, things you can't say enough, Robert, because I know that for me, um, every time I hear you talk, it, um, it really brings to light how how we do need to think about each kid so individualistically. Um, and um, one person just you know was was asking a little bit more about you know is, is actually is writing from the DYS system and um, here in Massachusetts and um, when they use a they standardly use a relapse prevention model and you know, how do you when you're within a system that uses relapse prevention um, how do you make sure that you really are paying attention to um, each individual kid's developmental um, curve and trajectory? I think the first step is to make sure that you are very disciplined about conducting a sufficient a developmental assessment on each young person that you're going to be working with and then making sure that that translates into the work that you're actually doing with the, the young person. Sometimes we offer interventions to youth more on the basis of the fact that that's what we've got rather than that what that's a good fit for what they need. Uh, that's unlikely to change unless we step back and say, uh, what is the range of needs that we typically see in our particular system? Um, and how do we adapt what we have to be as uh, consistent with the risk need resiliency model uh, that takes into account the individual, sorry, risk need responsivity model that takes into account the responsivity characteristics of each kid, like their developmental phase or cognitive capacities. Great. It will start at the beginning. The more you can understand the young person that you have developmentally, the more you can think about what needs to be done to um, modify the approach that you've got in order to best take that into account with the resources that you have. Mm -hmm. um, one person, uh, earlier in your presentation you talked about um, a couple of times you mentioned sort of sexually touch, you know, touching younger um, children might mirror um, some of their own victimization. And um, what the question was um, was, you know, what ages are we talking about? And particularly, you know, what age, you know, does that acting out do you think becomes more purposeful? I don't know that you can do it by age. I, I think this is again one of those questions where you have to answer the the, the question at the individual level. Uh, this may seem like a uh, really simple-minded uh, or extreme example, but in, in fact, I, I have seen it and, and fairly recently as well. So most people feel very comfortable with the um, uh, thinking as a sexually reactive child, a child who is four or five or perhaps six and has had a recent uh, or, or chronic experiences with sexual victimization, um, but uh, less comfortable um, in taking to in taking it into account when we have a young person who has uh, an intellectual or developmental disability um, although they may be much older uh, especially if the child does not have the visible stigmata of an intellectual disability so for example in this particular case I'm thinking of uh, this was a young person who had an IQ of about 60 or so 65 he was cognitively and emotionally functioning much more like a five-year-old than the almost 13-year-old that, that he was. Um, um, and it took a long time for people to begin to sort of sort through that because although he physically looked uh, normative and he was almost 13, that the better way to understand his problematic sexual behavior was through the lens of somebody who was um, experiencing the world developmentally more as a, about a five-year-old. Um, so mm -hmm. again, I, it, I, I think we, we I, I don't know how we can draw a bright line and say this. I'm just making up this number. If you're under nine, it's reactive. If it's over nine, it's purposeful. I think it takes. Um, I think it takes. I, I, I've I've certainly seen, for example, kids with very very complicated trauma histories, uh, where um, they they were much older, but the degree of anxiety. Um, 
and its association with their PTSD features made it seem like a very, very different kind of behavior. The behaviors were the same, but a very, very different kind of behavior than somebody who was really kind of a socialized delinquent where sexual misconduct was part of a broader pattern, a more versatile pattern of, of instrumental delinquency. Great. Yeah, I, I like that I'm actually beginning to understand this enough that I could, I could almost have guessed the answer to that one, Robert. <laughs> so um, another great another great question was like um, I think take on the other end of this is you know you're talking a lot about how we as clinicians work with the in, the individual client and this question was how do we advocate for youth who are significant significantly developmentally delayed, but are of an age where they are viewed as an adult in the system. And questions that went on to say, how do I help prosecution understand the negative impact of, um, on such a, a child or, quote, adult um, on the registry and some of the other decisions that may come, come forward? Well, I think the first thing that uh, you need to do is to begin to try, and I, I sort of think of them as advocacy materials or advocacy booklets. So where there is relevant research or where there has been um, practice established that people may want to uh, be familiar with. So uh, I often talk with prosecutors and judges and um, uh, lawyers um, in, in my line of work, and, and many of them are completely unaware that in uh, f uh, the United Kingdom, for example, uh, if somebody is uh, developmentally delayed or mentally ill I, or under the age, I believe it's 18, um, the police aren't even allowed to um, to to do a custodial interrogation following an arrest with them unless they've been specially trained to do so and unless the um, interview is fully audio or videotaped. And when they, they, they here in the United States, they seem entirely stunned by this often. And then when you talk to them about the the very uh, the stressful experience of having somebody with those vulnerabilities being in that kind of situation and the very high rates of uh, false confession, they begin to sort of step back and say, wait a minute, maybe these folks really are different. Maybe these differences matter. Um, and I've certainly seen prosecutors who felt adamant that they needed to try and place this person on the stand, but when they chose to do so, they were willing to engage really in a, in a process of, of teaching this individual how to uh, manage that experience without um, undue stress and in some cases um, enlisting the um, support of the judge, the intervention of the judge to make sure that um, defense counsel did not ask questions in language, for example, that was beyond the verbal comprehension of the person on the stand uh, and to stay back a certain number of feet from the individual. So to be an effective advocate, you really have to be something of a a scholar of the, the of the area of concern and be willing to really be an educator. The most effective advocates, I think, in, in that kind of context are really people who are very effective educators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thank you, Robert. Um, if you could maybe get, um, help explain a little bit more about when you talk about problematic sexual behaviors, what do you mean by that? And the question particularly was asking, like, um, are you distinguishing that problematic sexual behavior would be for 12 or under where they can't be charged and then when a, a, a child is over 12 and they are charged, would that be when you call about a sexual offending behavior? Uh, so if you could just explain that so that I think there's some confusion in the audience sure, around that. Sure, sure. Um, I refer to problematic sexual behavior as one which either transiently or more persistently is um, getting a child in trouble. It's a fairly simple-minded one, but getting them in trouble in their family and their peer group. It might be legally, it might not be legally, um, but in, in any one of a number of contexts. And when that sexual behavior uh, is is sort of well beginning to, to significantly deviate from the developmental norm in terms of its frequency or its intensity uh, or its targeting or whatever else it might be, um, then we sort of we, we acknowledge that this child is now off of a, of a developmental path. I call sexual offenders people who have been adjudicated of sexual offenses. Um, I, I think it's dangerous um, and imprecise to call youth who have engaged in sexually aggressive or abusive behavior, sexual offenders, um, until such time as a uh, court has decided that they are in an adjudication of delinquency or a criminal matter. Prior to that, I think we want to describe the behavior, problematic sexual behavior, rather than the individual uh, juvenile sex offender, 
um, and to look at just how off of the developmental norm this particular behavior is. Now, this may mean things that are unpleasant for us, uh, and I'll just give you two quick examples of that. Um, one is a youth that I saw who had been arrested for um, his second indecent assault and battery. Um, since most children who engage in problematic sexual behaviors will either self-desist or will desist when told to stop it uh, without intensive uh, professional intervention, uh, the fact that he had come back a second time had already flagged him as someone different and special. And so uh, the court wanted to know what to do with him. And one of the things that I learned was that this was a young man who was now in ninth grade. Uh, he was from a middle school. He was now a freshman in high school. He had been in a middle school where since seventh grade, in seventh and eighth grade, this one group of both boys and girls um, had, they had nicknamed themselves the grab assers. And they uh, spent a lot of time grabbing each other and other students in ways that were chargeable as indecent assault and battery. Um, so when he comes to me, and his mistake actually is that uh, he had targeted twice um, a girl who uh, was only ambivalently involved with this, and her parents were the ones who had been outraged and wanted to press charges. So I can either think of him as um, a youth with a problematic sexual behavior uh, once he gets adjudicated, I might call him a juvenile sex offender and put him down as sort of, you know, as uh, give him a risk rating that I write on his individual forehead. Or I can say, you know, what mostly seems to be going on here, since he doesn't engage in this behavior when he's outside of this school setting, doesn't do it at the malls, doesn't do it while he's shopping, doesn't do it when he's playing baseball, I can either think of him as, uh, uh, in a static way, um, as though he's a, a uh, an offender, if you will, or I can say the real problem here is a peer group. And what are the odds that he would continue this behavior if his peer group stopped it? Um, so that's, you know, sort of one example of, of contextualizing it um, a little bit. And I, I just noticed that we're beginning to press against time. So if there's one other question that you want to ask me. Well, there's, I don't know if it's a quick enough question, but if you can do this in two minutes. Um, okay. How about, um, I think the question, I think it's a great question around the, the risk need responsibility, responsibility model, which I know is getting a lot of popularity. Can you explain how the developmental perspective fits into that? Sure. Is that a, a two-minute response you can do? Um, I, I'll do the speed dating version of it. The other thing I did <laughs> want to mention, though, is uh, in terms of what's normative sexual behavior, um, I would mm -hmm. draw people's attention to a study that was published in October of 2013 on American youth uh, between the ages, I think it was about like 10 and 20 or 23. Um, and there's a very high percentage of sexually coercive behavior um, prevalent in um, large sample of American youth. Um, who are not out there being called sex offenders or even being called, you know, being clinically labeled, formally labeled as having problematic sexual behavior. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the course of uh, sexual behavior, boys start uh, a little bit earlier than, than girls do, but by age 18, uh, they're, gen they're gender equal. Mm -hmm. We don't know what happens as they go into their 20s, but um, I mean, do we individually think, do we think this is a problem to be solved on an individual level, or do we think this is a problem where if we have a, a kid who is in, engaging in sexually coercive behaviors and that's part of a peer culture, I mean, do we think of them as being a normative adolescent who's got a behavior that's going to get him into trouble if he keeps it up, or do we think of this kid as a sex offender, which is a whole different thing? So the risk responsivity, speed dating version, uh, this is a model that had evolved out of adult uh, criminal justice risk are those things that are pretty obvious, but the developmental model would also drive for specific attention to protective factors, developmental phases and capacities, and contest contextualizing risks. Needs are specifically criminogenic needs, or in this case, those unmet needs that contribute to maintaining misconduct, and here that would be problematic sexual behavior. These needs can be individual. Individual, like satis uh, they have unsatisfying interpersonal relationships. They can be family, like inadequate parental supervision. They can be social and environmental, like the need for opportunities for a, a positive adult mentoring or access to structured leisure activities. They can be contextual like more adequate adult supervision, less accessibility to vulnerable victims, better risk management uh, by systems, 
And responsivity is the uh, way in which we individualize interventions on the basis of individual factors such as cognitive capacity and learning style, attachment style, presence or absence of learning disability, developmental or intellectual disability, mental disorders, uh, the individual's uh, ability or interest in refraining from PSB. Uh, Christian did not want to and was unwilling to accept an intervention uh, to stay away from Abby or to stop this with Abby. Um, so the, the developmental perspective fits well within the risk-need responsivity model by focusing attention on the developmental dimensions of each of these principles and individualizing the R&R &R analysis for risk management and intervention planning for each youth. Thank you, Robert. You, you brought speed dating to new heights, I think, <laughs> today. Thank or, you. Or, or pressured speech. You, you make the call. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I just want to take a few minutes to also just say, um, to let people know that the new Neary Press catalog is about to hit the street. So um, if you're on this, uh, this webinar, we'll be sending you one electronically. And if you'd like a hard copy, just let us know. Send us an email. We'll send one to you. Um, also, uh, if, uh, since you're on this call, we'll also be sending you um, a link to our Neary Press newsletter, which takes a, one research article each um, each month and puts it into something that's easy to read and short enough to read over a cup of coffee. That's kind of our motto. Um, a couple of housekeeping reminders, just to say that we will, in a week, send you um, an email reminder that, that has a link to the PowerPoint a PowerPoint of this presentation and recording of this webinar as well as the certificate of completion. So you'll be getting that sometime next week. Um, and if you'd like to see any previous webinars, uh, you can go to our website at www.nearypress.org. Um, we have a couple more uh, um, webinars coming up. Um, the next one is on May 13th, which is about the prevention source book with Dr. Keith Kaufman. We also have one in June now, which would, will be with Dr. Elizabeth Letourneau and Dr. Andy Harris, which will be talking about some of the policy implications and what we know about the impact of policy on adolescents and youth. I also uh, would be remiss not to be thanking our sponsors because we could not be doing this without our sponsors. These sponsors include the United Methodist Family Services, St. Joseph Orphanage, James R. Reynolds, Central New York Psychiatric Center, the Durham Family Court Clinic, the Center for Clinical and Forensic Services, the ITM Group, and Branch Erlo Society. I want to thank each of these sponsors. And if you would like to become a sponsor for our, our, season, our series next year, the 2014-2015 series, um, you, again, will be, um, it's $98 for an individual and $250 for an organization. As individuals, you'll be getting copies, uh, guaranteed a, a seat at the table here, uh, the webinar table. You'll be getting copies of our current applications and current protect perspective series books, which has a value of $149. And um, we'll also be offering you uh, nine CE credits for attending all nine webinars and taking and passing the test. Um, last, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to Robert. That was just, um, as always, magnificent. Thank you to Greg Latham as well, who could not be here for helping to write the booklet. Um, if people are interested in the booklet, you can go on the Neary Press website for that. Um, and thanks for our audience for joining with us. Again, we have um, just a tremendous number of people out there. So um, would you um, please just take the time to sign off, fill out our, our, um, our feedback form. And um, there's a couple questions which came in. We'll try to get back to those questions sort of by email as well, since we kept, weren't able to reach them all. Thank you again, Robert. That really was magnificent. I appreciate it. Thank you time. for the opportunity. And to my colleagues on this uh, webinar, um, have fun out there. The kids need you. <laughs> That's great advice. Great. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.